Here's the, um, the equation for these, um, the canonical relationship for these objects. Uh, and uh, for quantization, as always, the main difficulty is that there's delta function here, so we cannot do the usual canonical quantization, take a Q and B, of course, an algebra term that into an operator algebra, because it's not well defined with delta function. In uh, usual quantum field theory with these um, mode operators, what we do is we um, integrate spatially, so we introduce mirroring and then the delta functions for the smooth objects um, go away. Um, that is, um, and then you can construct a well-defined quantum field theory. Um, that's not available um, for gravity directly, that's a part of background independent measures. Uh, to introduce smearing in the usual way, we need a metric. We have to know the integration measure and, and know how to integrate, and that involves the background metric usually. So um, that's the crucial point where this recombination is important because it turns out if you use connections and these densitized triads, they're almost like two forms. 
then uh, we can integrate them naturally without even using a metric. Uh, we integrate uh, the connection one dimensionally and then take an exponential to the autonomies. We integrate the densitized stripes like a two form, if we integrate it two dimensionally over surfaces. And then this, um, although we don't fully integrate all any one of these objects of the fields, um, this one plus two dimensional integration turns out to be sufficient to remove the delta functions. So we get a well defined algebra, a simple autonomy flux algebra. Um, and then one can look at possible representations and um, choose one of them uh, to uh, formulate the quantum theory. Now the good thing, uh, which was realized only after a few years, is that there's actually a unique representation of that algebra if uh, we also require diffeomorphism covariance, so spatial diffeomorphisms. Um, all of these edges, these curves and surfaces are all in space because it's canonical, so it's not space time yet. So we are, initially we just have spatial diffeomorphisms, and they act on the algebra, or first on alarms and fluxes, and then with the covariant action on the algebra by just moving these curves and surfaces around in space. So there's natural action of the diffeomorphism group spatial diffeomorphisms. And it turns out if um, one then looks for <coughs> representations of that algebra that, uh, that, are, uh, that have a unique, uh, that have a unitary action of the diffeomorphism group um, after on the representation space, um, then that, that there's a unique representation. So there's not even much choice at this kinematical level in setting up the theory. Um, the quantization is, uh, the representation is also uh, quite easy to construct. Well, I simplify it even more by using U1. So initially the group um, that we use is SU2 for spatial rotations. It's a bit simpl simpler just technically to use U1. So we have um, U1 valued holonomies, just uh, phase factors. And then um, these holonomies are going to be uh, just like creation operators. So we start with a simple state, which for usual quantum field theories would be the vacuum state. We don't interpret that as a vacuum here, but it's anyway a basic state that we can use to set up the representation. It's um, it, um, in the connection representation, it's just a constant that turns out to be normalized. I haven't mentioned, I'm not going to mention much of the inner product, but this is going to be a normalized state. Um, so the state of connection is compact, one can make sense of these in a constant state. Uh, and then we can create all possible excited states by using these holonomies as multiplication operators. So we use them for all kinds of curves. Um, they are independent excitations. And each of them can be excited by an integer number um, to get to higher excitation levels. Those so states and the connection representation, again, look just like products of base vectors. So that's is it to for SU2? It's a bit more complicated because one has to make sure it's all SU2 invariant, but there's, it's also possible using um, these coupling rules for spins, and um, that gives us a spin network space. But the basic idea for that is not, um, it's not different from the one example that I show here. Um, so these are the states, and already at this level, one can see that there's some kind of a discrete structure. Um, we have to but well, the basic state doesn't have any structure at all, but then if you look at excited states, um, they create excitations only along these curves, uh, one-dimensionally. Each curve can be excited um, by itself, so this is indicated by the colors here. But then to get something which looks like a uh, nearly smooth state that fill in space, uh, we need to um, excite even many different curves. Uh, and then we hope that at some point it extends enough that this resembles a continuum geometry. Um, but that also indicates some of the difficulties because from the perspective of fusion quantum field, that's a many particle state, we have to use high excitations of uh, many different kinds to um, fill space densely and then um, of course it's not easy to deal with um, these states in quantum ways. Um, but there are at least uh, some properties that one can extract. Uh, the, the first property that one is interested in uh, refer to geometry. Uh, so um, geometry is encoded by these fluxes, which in the SU2 case, that's related to the densitized pipe. That then, again is related to the spatial metric. So if we quantize this object, it tells us uh, what kind of spectra, for instance, we have for spatial geometry. Um, these are conjugate to the connection. So in the connection representation, they will be derivative operators. Uh, we've seen the state, so that can be computed directly. Uh, gamma, again, is just like yesterday, in two hours, so obviously the music parameter, so that also shows up here from the syntactic structure. 
Um, but I'm always using a real values in this case, um, the whole talk, no complex values for gamma. Uh, so that's the action of flux operators. Um, and um, it, uh, in the simple case, it directly gives us an eigenvalue equation. So the states are, uh, that we just constructed are eigenstates of fluxes with these eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are discrete, so n's were integers, intersection numbers are integers. So fluxes have discrete spectra, and from the fluxes we can construct areas and volumes, they also have discrete spectra. So um, that's the second property, um, uh, also still at the kinematical level, um, that um, discrete structure for spatial geometry automatically arise. So at this level it's all well understood, um, quite unique, um, we don't have a choice of the representation, and then also these basic operators, they are free of ambiguities. The spatial geometry, the quantum geometry in this setting is well understood. But um, of course, one still has to make sure that um, these spatial slices uh, fit in into some kind of uh, space time, uh, quantum space time geometry. Uh, so that brings in the dynamics. And uh, that's where the complicated problems start. Dynamics is implemented in the setting by constraints. Um, they have to be solved, and um, it also has to be done to improve consistency to ensure that the spatial structure that we have really corresponds to something for varying. Um, and, and that's um, certainly more difficult. Also, it doesn't appear as unique as the kinematical constructions. Um, but so far, at least, we can still read off some of the properties. Uh, so that's, first of all, the classical expression for the gravitational constraint. So that's just for vacuum, if there's matter that would be added, the Hamiltonian would be added to the constraint. F here is the curvature of the Ashtekar connection, a gamma of the spin connection, which is a function of the drive, so it's a complicated expression that we have to quantize here. Um, and uh, initially it looks even, it's not just uh, complicated, there even seem to be problems because there's, uh, we have to divide by the determinant of E here, We've just seen that E is quantized to flux operators which have discrete spectra containing zero. So if you have such an operator, it doesn't have a unique, uh, any uh, densely defined inverse, so it seems problematic to consider even those factors. Uh, and it turns out that this can be dealt with. Um, there's an identity like this, which reformulates exactly this expression here in terms of the Poisson bracket of the connection and functional, which uh, is just the total volume, and which um, does not have any inverse. So the left-hand side can then easily be quantized. We turn this into an expression in terms of flux operators. A is quantized in terms of polynomials. The Poisson bracket will be a commutator. So that gives a well-defined expression. Um, the curvature part can be treated in a way that's very similar to a lattice gauge theory. So we just use um, extended loops. And, um, and the group is small enough, it approximates the curvature. Uh, it's, not, it's not going to be, uh, be exactly the curvature of the components, but um, at least in a continuum limit, in this way we can make sure that gravity in the usual way is reproduced, and then higher order terms will amount to um, some kind of... Um, so sorry, Martin, so, so, so what is your opinion about the singularity? Did it disappear? <coughs> Yeah, we're going to see this in more detail on the next slide, I think. Um, uh, so the, it's, it's going to be a densely defined operator. No, yeah. but that is a singularity, right? In a pure classical theory, okay? Yeah. And then you have written down a for salt bracket, so that's all at a classical level. Yeah, classically, that's an identity. So yeah. If you, but so you're saying there is no singularity, even classically? Well, there's no singularity of this type, yeah. Good. Well, well, classically, no, no, classically there's, uh, it's an identity, so you're not going to remove anything, you just reformulate it. But then it turns out you can quantize the left-hand side, you just cannot quantize the right-hand side in this way at all. So, um, by asking for a representation of that object on the representation space that we use here, using holonomies and the fluxes, the singularity is removed. It's not, it's not happening classically. It's um, by looking for by selecting this particular representation and then demanding that this object, because it is a constraint, the constraint has to be quantized, it must have a representation. And then at the quantum level, the singularity disappears. Um, so, and that's where all this background independence matter, because that forced us to use um, polynomials and fluxes. If you, if you do some kind of wheeler de quantization, you can easily make sense of the right-hand side. 
it's, um, it's not bounded, but it's, it would be a densely defined operator, at least in, in mini superspace settings. It's not clear what that means in, in, in homogeneous settings, if it should be that width. But um, uh, an operator like one by scale factor is completely well defined in Wiener de Witt. It's, um, it's a densely defined operator. But uh, even in a mini superspace setting, I'm not going to discuss this, but you will have problems uh, with the loop representation. And um, then if you see it's a loop representation, not just quantization, it's a particular representation that we use, that we, uh, we move to singularity. Uh, and then, yeah, that is, um, this equation is a bit different because that's not a classical identity. Here you do have these correction terms. Um, and then, but anyway, that's not related to a singularity, that's just representing the curvature components. And then finally, the, uh, the last difficult part uh, is um, the spin connection here, but that can also be expressed with the Poisson brackets in terms of the objects we already constructed. And um, then there's a well-defined expression for the total constraint. It's complicated, but we can at least analyze it. And as uh, is indicated by these constructions, each one of these uh, tricks here that one has to play implies a certain corrections. Uh, so this one uh, implies obvious correction from these higher order terms if we expand. Um, but even um, the first equation, even though it's a classical identity, if you quantize then the left-hand side, so that's the same equation, if you quantize the left-hand side, you get a well-defined operator, and uh, you can compute eigenvalues and, and everything. It's, um, it's, it's a simple operator. And then you can compare with uh, what you expect if you just put in uh, flux eigenvalues on the right-hand side, which would not be well-defined, would not give you a well-defined operator, but you can at least compare um, this for configurations that are not singular classically. And then if you take the ratio, you get a function like this, so um, clearly it's not um, a constant one in any of these cases. Uh, so they, are, they indicate that there are corner corrections if you keep, uh, look for a representation of the left-hand side here. Um, and the Corrections become stronger if you go to smaller flux eigenvalues. If you, you can think of the flux eigenvalues as some kind of elementary sizes um, that you have in your lattice state, in, in these uh, discrete states. And if um, the flux eigenvalues become smaller, your lattice is um, realized on smaller scales. And that's where these corrections become larger. Uh, and since you asked about the singularity, we can also see that this function drops off to zero here, so it's, um, that's why it's cutting off the, um, the classical divergence of the right-hand side here. And in this way, um, the Hamiltonian is well-defined, and even it has indications for the dynamics and cosmological models. One can easily see that this means that this, you know, in a dynamical sense, there's no similarity. Um, on the other hand, if you go to larger values on um, all these functions, so for all kinds of ambiguity parameters, it's not a unique quantization at this stage, but for all values that we can choose here, the function approaches one, just the classical expression, if you go to large flux values. Uh, so in this way, at least for this kind of effect here, the classical limit is realized. Um, but anything that happens with the true quantum state, it's at a finite value of mu, so you do have some correction that might be small if mu is large, but they are present and then have um, additional implications. Uh, and also, for later use, I noticed that this is uh, the, uh, the approach here to one is always from above in those cases. Although the ambiguities, the fact that it approaches one from above is, um, seems to be a robust feature. Uh, so that's the main correction that I'm going to use. Um, there's a second type um, from these solanomies, um, kind of some kind of higher order corrections. And then finally, cornerback reaction, that is what one would usually capture in effective um, theories of quantum gravity, as in the previous talk. Um, the first two are specific uh, to the representation that we use, so they are specific quantum geometry corrections that do not just come from uh, dynamical effects like loop corrections. Um, so perhaps that is, at least in this context, more interesting to study those first and see what that gives us on top of what we expect from effective considerations. Uh, so. Um, whatever we get, we don't really know what Hamiltonian we have because it's complicated to analyze, but it's some kind of modified gravity theory. Um, there are all these extra terms, like the correction function algebra. Um, and the main question then is really a covariance. So we put in these corrections at the Hamiltonian level. At the Hamiltonian level, it's not easy to see uh, whether covariance is realized. If you have an action, you see that immediately. 
uh, or if it's broken, you see that immediately. If it's Hamiltonian, then that is more tricky. Uh, but it's still uh, as important as in, at the action level because um, it, um, if it's not covariant, covariance corresponds to gauge transformations, space time Hamiltonian changes. If that's broken, um, then the theory is not consistent. Your equations that you get on don't have common solutions. Um, so one of the main difficulties still in this framework is to realize covariance um, at the full level for completely arbitrary uh, configurations with these Hamiltonian constraints that I just indicated. Um, we, we still don't know how to do that exactly, but um, at least we can. What we can do is we can put in corrections that we expect, like these um, inverse prime corrections and then see how they change um, the structure of Hamiltonians and uh, see whether it is still possible to have um, some kind of consistent deformation that corrects the dynamics and um, the gauge structure but does not remove any of the gauge transformations. Um, and there are a few calculations that already exist uh, that I'm going to show in the rest of the talk. Um, the first one is, uh, uses um, exactly what I just mentioned. So we just take a classical uh, Hamiltonian for um, the gravitational part of the theory. Um, so the blue stuff would be classical, and then we put in just a, a function of the form that I just showed, which comes from these inverse trig operators, which we expect to be there in some kind of effective Hamiltonian corresponding to loop point gravity. Uh, we can compute the function, it's just one correction, it's just one of the effects that we expect, but then at least we can probe whether um, this one here uh, can be part of a consistent uh, theory that is still covariant. Um, and uh, in this, this first example, I'm not going to discuss covariance, but I'm going to discuss the dispersion relation so one can see at least some of these equations. Now, if we analyze the Hamiltonian, it's very easy at a linearized level, so we get a wave equation like this. Alpha appears then in different places. Um, so, what, how do you the alpha? So, um, well, we, we would just put in, just take the function that we get here from right. these operators. That's from an eigenvalue calculation, and we just put it in. So it's not it's not a strict derivation at this stage of an effective Hamiltonian. So the effective Hamiltonian would be the expectation value of, of the full Hamiltonian. That's not exactly what we do um, because they are products. You would also get um, the correlation terms between the different fields. But that's ignored here. So we just um, take this one function and see um, because that's already changing the structure of space time in some way. We see. Um, what that implies and whether it's, um, there might already be inconsistencies, so we could already try to rule out the theory if um, that correction doesn't make sense. Um, there are other corrections, so if it, if it works here, it doesn't mean the full theory is consistent because that hasn't been checked yet, but at least we can uh, test um, this particular case here, uh, <coughs> see if it's consistent and if it has other um, implications that might be interesting for observations. <coughs> maybe at place. Sorry, Martin, but alpha is it constant or is it run? Well, it, um, it's not constant, it depends on the background. Yeah. Uh, just like the flux values earlier, um, they are related to the dense size pi uh, in, in a way that depends on the underlying state. So there, there's certainly some, a lot of running. Um, but also, I was just wondering, if I take the k to zero limit for your dispersion relation, I still have, even for long wavelengths, uh, a modified dispersion. So it's even, it's even acting in the infrared, this effect. Yeah, so, it de yeah, so the, the dependence here is on, on the background. So infrared, it would mean uh, an, a, a long wavelength wave. But if alpha is large, that usually means you have um, large curvature effects or something. So it's, um, it would be, um, your, your background space time would not be um, semi-classical at this stage. So it would be strong from geometry effects not from the wave that you consider, but just from the background on which you put it. Um, that's why you would have strong corrections. I think, um, I suppose it's just <coughs> present uh, for the rotation of waves, not for uh, any other form of... Uh, oh, yeah, I'll come to that. Um, yeah, also for others. That's just the example for gravitational waves. And if that would be the only case, then you might think there are problems because alpha um, as I just showed on this plot, it um, tends to be larger than one, at least for a regime that we consider more or less in classical. So that would look like see with superluminal motion. But um, then you're right, uh, for matter, the same effects appear. Matter Hamiltonians <coughs> also have um, inverse powers of the triad, so they have similar corrections. I had in mind that to be very sharp. 
that uh, we have uh, we have already constraints on the difference between the speed of photons and gravitons, for example. And but uh, actually, without the you mean uh, light waves and uh, gravitational waves, I don't, I don't care about the continuous spectrum. So it, 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 we know that delta C is of order of uh, one percent, I think, no? Yeah. Well, yeah. Let me just do the next slide for us, and then you'll see. So we have the same kind of corrections in here. Initially, the functions are well, the, the operators first, and then the function that we expect are independent. Uh, so there's no initial relationship to alpha. Uh, we get, again, a corrected weight equation, a corrected dispersion relation like this. And um, then, of course, um, yeah, you could say in most cases, if you just do this arbitrarily, you would get different speeds. Um, it could be superluminal motion, subluminal, but at least there would be a difference. Uh, now this is all at, um, at a very uh, preliminary level because um, we've just put in the corrections uh, kinematically basically. We have not uh, made sure yet that this is really part of a consistent uh, deformation of a consistent constraint algebra. Uh, now that's the level on which uh, most um, derivations of uh, the strip relations in Newcomb gravity work. Um, the Gambini pulling calculations, for instance, they just used the matter Hamiltonian put in corrections and got a well, different kind of correction in their case, but they also got the modified dispersion relations. And uh, so at this stage, when um, since there are well, ambiguities, if you just look at the operators kinematically, there are no large restrictions. <laughs> now, so, um, so just a question, is this at least classically consistent, for example, with the anchor and all that stuff? You, you don't get well, that, that's part of the consistency thing. Yeah, that hasn't been tested at this level. Yeah. Um, but, but that's exactly the point. We have to test it. There are ways, um, it's not obvious how to formulate the Bianchi identity at the canonical level, but there are ways using a constrained algebra to implement it. So you would um, add these to the gravitational part of the constraint at the matter Hamiltonian, and that must form a certain type of algebra um, more with the different model and constraint in the mind itself. Uh, if, if that algebra is realized of a certain type, then the Bianchi identity is satisfied. Um, now this can be done, it's a long calculation, but it, it can be done. And then it turns out you get exactly the relationship that um, identifies these constants here uh, in the dispersion relation. <coughs> so after you implement consistency, um, the, the speeds of uh, gravitational waves and photons are the same. They're not exactly the classical speeds uh, because alpha still um, may not be equal to one. Um, but at least there's no difference in the uh, propagation for these different waves. Now, what I'm trying to emphasize here is, is many calculations that have been done did not do this final step here because it's always very complicated. So you might get uh, modified dispersion relations, but um, consistency, if that's not, if that's not implemented, uh, might provide extra consistency conditions like this one, which um, make, that would make effects uh, more consistent because in this case, causality at least uh, seems realized, but um, that might also lead to weaker effects on um, <coughs> Okay, but if I add other, other stuff, like massive fields, for instance, yeah. got my yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you get massive, I mean, the point is that is it, it's always, uh, are you, let me put it this way, are you always sure that uh, you have some form of constraint which at the end of the day will enforce uh, the, the, the coefficient for the k square to be the same for all the kind of uh, particles, uh, spin 2, spin 1, uh, Massive particle because it's enough that you have one particle that travels at a different speed, then you can play the game of uh, casting a constraint. Well, well, so far we don't have a general argument, but all cases we checked um, give a condition like this one that in the end leads to the same speed. And, but you don't have an argument to say that it should be that. Uh, not yet. Uh, there might be one. Um, I'm going to show more show a more general algebra and then consideration about symmetries on the next few slides. But uh, and there's one case, um, it's not really physical propagation, but if you do a cosmological perturbation field, then some of the modes uh, seem to have a different speed. Some of the scalar modes, uh, some of the contribution to the scalar mode. So we're not sure yet what that means, if that's problematic or not. Uh, so far it doesn't seem problematic, but um, um, there's a thing. problem is an opportunity to cast the constraint on this. Perhaps, yeah. But, but that's anyway, it's not a matter propagation. That's um, something that shows up in the perturbation theory. So, um, yeah, we're not sure yet, but um, at least um, in many cases, um, <coughs> this consistency arises. 
So at a more general level, um, this is the kind of algebra that uh, one has to realize. Uh, so there are these quantum corrections in the Hamiltonians. And um, uh, again, just with the blue terms, that would be the classical algebra uh, underlying any kind of um, general relativity theory. If, um, if that algebra would be broken, then the field is inconsistent, it's not covariant. So if the algebra is realized, it's completely equivalent to saying that it's a covariant theory, as we always would say at the um, level of an action. Um, if it's not realized, um, then it's broken, uh, then, then there's no covariance, the field is inconsistent. Now, what happens with this alpha correction is um, the algebra does change, as indicated by the red terms here. But it does not break um, the general form of the algebra. So it's still a closed algebra, H with H, two Hamiltonian constraints, give us a diffeomorphism constraint. Um, the structure function changes, so there's a, clearly a correction even in the algebra, not just in the dynamics. Um, but it's still closed. So in this sense, um, the, the number of gauge transformations is preserved, and um, there's no anomaly. Now that also tells us uh, something at least about the structure, what kind of effective action we might have. Uh, if you look at higher curvature effective actions, they would all produce a classical algebra. So no higher curvature effective action can correspond to this one. And that means the correction that we have cannot be just of higher curvature type. There's something else going on here. We still don't know what exactly that is. It might be some kind of non-commutative structure at an effective level. Um, and we're trying to compute what that would be. Um, but clearly, these quantum geometry effects um, provide something that we haven't really seen uh, so far at the level of um, effective actions. But Martin, I mean, just, just uh, that, that's all nice. I mean, you might have a deformed algebra. But coming back to the question of Zhao, I think this is very important. Bianchi 2 might here introduce extra constraint on H that is not consistent with the equations of motion. I mean, that's very important to work that out, right? Well, the Bianchi identity can be derived from the constraint algebra. So if... Um, so but deforming, deforming the algebra is still dangerous in getting an extra constraint on H. Uh, you do not get an extra constraint. You would also deform the Bianchi identity. But um, there's, okay, still, yeah. there's still an identity like this. So at the Hamiltonian level, these, um, these are all the consistency conditions, and it's fully equivalent to the usual um, covariant level. So there are no extra consistency conditions um, at the other level. Um, you know, there's no paper by Kukach in the 70s that really discusses how you get the Bianchi identity, for instance, um, out of the constraint alpha. Yeah, I know that. Uh, so, um, yeah, so these deformations exist. Um, so far, it hasn't been shown for the full theory, just in some examples. So the one I showed is for linearized inhomogeneities uh, and these inverse triad corrections. There are also examples um, for alarm corrections, not for um, full um, inhomogeneities, but just in spherical of symmetry and 2 plus 1. And also here, uh, it's a different type of correction. Uh, so that's from expressing the curvature components in terms of polynomies. But it also leads to a deformation uh, plus extra conditions on the quantization parameters. Um, and here it depends on the connection. Delta is a certain parameter. It depends on how exactly these monomial effects are implemented. Uh, so there are different examples now for the type of quantum geometry correction that we have, which refers to deformations. Um, at this level, it's clearly deformed general relativity. It's not so obvious yet how to derive from space time symmetries something related to special relativity, um, but it's possible. We still have to go through some of the calculations. That also is based on um, older papers by Kupac. Um, the idea here is that um, the full algebra that I just showed uh, generates uh, deformations of spatial slices in space-time. So that's a hypersurface deformation algebra. In general relativity, these deformations can be arbitrary as long as the spatial slice remains spatial. And, um, but for special relativity, we'll just restrict this to uh, specific types of deformations like these tilts here, which will just implement um, for linear deformations of spatial hypersurfaces. And then this would simply correspond to the usual uh, transformation that we do in the Minkowski diagram. So that's a way to uh, restrict um, these full general relativity algebras to special relativity algebras. Uh, and it's particularly interesting for the second example that I showed. Um, the one for holonomy corrections. 
Now, initially, the corrections don't depend on a symmetry generator. So it's not directly a nonlinear realization. Uh, so the generators are H and D, and the correction depends on A. It's a background field, it's a connection. Um, so it's not directly a, a nonlinear realization. But um, if one looks at the exact form of the connection components and uh, uses uh, concepts like brown York cross and local quantities, uh, or if it's added to that ADM quantities, ADM momentum, then these connection components can be related to momenta uh, in, in these uh, specific regimes. And uh, momentum is uh, another generator of the Poincaré algebra. So H and D correspond to the Lorentz algebra part, and then AI here is related to translations that correspond to the uh, missing part in the Poincaré algebra. So if you have this additional uh, identification here between the connection components and possible other quantities, then this equation amounts to a nonlinear realization of the Poincaré algebra. Uh, on the left-hand side, H generates these uh, hypersurface tilts if N and M are linear functions. Uh, so these correspond to boosts. We are considering the commutator of two boosts here. And then on the right-hand side, normally we get just a rotation. So D is just a spatial of D formation. But then with the correction, there's also a nonlinear factor here, the cosine of the translation generator. So that's a particular example of a deformed algebra that's um, in some way derived from Newton and gravity, or at least it follows from the effects that are implied in the algebra of the constraints. Um, so I just leave it here at this uh, schematic level. We haven't uh, computed all the details or discussed possible relationships to examples that have been discussed. Um, just to end with a few so slides. So, so, just, so the obvious question is whether the guys are new. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it, it looks very similar to examples that have been discussed um, for DSR. So it's probably the ones that, and we don't have to do all the work again. I guess we just have to look at the papers. Uh, I think in, in many cases, um, the cosine would just be replaced by a square root. So it's perhaps not too different from um, a square root of 1 minus translation 6. That's it. At least for small values of the momentum, it's very similar. Um, the whole structure, of course, might still change, but um, it's, it's a similar thing. I, well, I sure can certainly go through this uh, and find out what's really happening. Um, but just um, <coughs> a few more remarks closer to observation. Some of the remarks um, on the question have already asked about the Yankee identity. Uh, another implication is that um, since we have this deformed algebra, in addition to just um, high curvature effects, or whatever we expect for usually effective actions, there might be um, stronger corrections. For higher curvature type of effective actions, what we expect is um, just corrections of this type, at most, something divided by the Hubble radius. Now, with this uh, deformation of the algebra, our whole space-time structure changes. So, and we've seen it, the effective action, whatever it is, cannot be just higher curvature type. So there are additional effects, and they, can sometimes produce effects that are much larger than this one. And the main mechanism here is non conservation of power. So the argument is really related to the Yankee identity. But classically, uh, well, they're not really, well, it's not obvious to see, but they are relationships between the algebra that I showed, the Yankee identity, classically, and then um, a conservation law, or an approximate conservation law, at least, for the, um, for the power of. Um, of um, perturbations on our scale. So that's what one usually uses to evaluate inflation. Power is conserved between Hubble accident and reentrance, and then um, there's a simple identification. Now that all follows um, ultimately from the Bianchi identity or the conservation of stress energy. Now, we still have some kind of Bianchi identity, but just like the algebra is modified, it's uh, deformed. And that means um, the uh, conservation law that we classically have for the amplitude is not. Um, it's realized in a different way. Um, there's still a conservation law, but it doesn't re apply directly to the amplitude that one is interested in, but a different combination of the fields. And so that means um, if it's not exactly conserved, even though the, the slope that we get uh, from the non-conservation is still small at any given time, it might be of this value, uh, so there's still a plumb effect. Um, but <coughs> the, the deviations are active for a long time between Hubble accident reentrance, for instance, 
So by this argument, one can expect that the, uh, so the slope is also monotonic, um, that follows from properties of the corrections. One can expect that um, this might lead to a magnification effect. So um, it's not just single effects that are of this tiny size, but uh, depending on what regime, what wavelength, for instance, we're looking at, um, there might be magnifications. Yeah, but you also change the, the spectrum if you set that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's, 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 uh, it depends on the wavelength. So you have suppressions or magnification at different scales um, of different sizes, so you get a whole different spectrum. That's true. But that's still being evaluated for scalars. And the equations are a bit more complicated in that case. Examples already known for uh, tensor modes. And um, that's one example here. So alpha is parameterized in a certain way. Uh, in this plot, um, the power here is fixed. The so road is free. There's a certain parameterization of um, the underlying plus values. The different curves correspond to different prefactors. And as we can see, that determines um, when these uh, deviations are in. So the classical curve will just be the black one. And then at a certain range of the wavelength, you get um, magnifications. And that's um, the same kind of equation, but um, with the coefficient fixed, and then you change the power, and that changes the slope. So one can also, by looking at different um, uh, functions, one can also distinguish between the parameters, the coefficient here, or the powers. Mm -hmm. so, 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 sorry, how do you calculate the power spectrum? Well, you have, uh, this is for tensor mode, so you especially yeah. the linearized gravitational wave equation that I just showed, and then you go through the same. You just modify the equation and then... Yeah, I'm just surprised because you basically say at arbitrary high weight numbers, there's no deviation at all. I don't see any... From, from this correction, yeah. No, I understand. Yeah. But nevertheless, right, it's, it's still kind of gravitational wave spectrum that you're calculating. When you say in the ultraviolet, mm -hmm. nothing changes. And the dominant effect, or the only effect, actually. But it's dominant <laughs> might be okay, I'm not sure about that. But the only effect I see in the infrared. Yeah. Is that kind of obvious or intuitive? Well, the, the reason for that is that this, that this is a propagation effect. And the, um, the most on, on this side here, they just stay longest um, outside the Hubble radius, where this non conservation is most important. Uh, so, um, but still, to switch off new physics on no, the it's not, Well, it's, it's because it's just this alpha here. If you would include the other effects, like colonomy corrections and um, contact reaction, you get um, x ray effects here also in alpha. It's just this particular type that we started for which we have consistent equations and these consistent deformations, um, where the effects only happen on one side. Yeah, in the end, we have to combine everything, but uh, we're still working on that. It uh, makes the equations much more complicated. So, uh, to summarize, uh, from a fundamental perspective, uh, I think it's uh, quite interesting to note that consistent deformations uh, do exist. Uh, so, the, um, the corrections, as I indicated in the beginning are related uh, quite directly to the discreteness uh, of space time, of quantum space time geometry. Uh, but initially it follows from the principle because we want to implement background independence. And then here the flux operators, we are forced to introduce these corrections because they have certain properties um, about their spectra. Uh, so um, the corrections are related to the discreteness. They're not directly just um, discretization effects, but uh, more indirect discrete, uh, discreteness relationships, but still it's, um, it's a consequence of the discreteness and that means uh, one could expect that covariance cannot be realized, um, but it is possible, so um, we do have consistent deformations, but well, the effect is we don't have the, exactly the same classical algebra, but um, it's still consistent. So for general relativity there's no rigidity theorem of this, in this sense, um, it's malleable, we can do consistent deformation but even change the algebra, the structure of gauge and uh, of space time. Um, and that um, is something that does not happen for higher curvature terms. Um, well, the relationship to uh, deformed asymmetries um, exists. It's still uh, rather weak, probably, because we haven't done all the calculations. We haven't filled in all the gaps in the derivations. Uh, we don't really know what precise form we have. That's still to be studied. And um, certainly, there are problems in, the, well, in, in types, these types of DSR formulations then um, one of to see what that implies um, for deforming gravity because it would have that effects for well, that theory if ESR follows in some way uh, from the theory. Um, so that already indicates that there might be possibilities for phenomenology, dispersion relations can be computed. 
but also from the perturbation equations, which I did only very briefly here for tensor modes and scalars, which has been developed. Um, there are also many um, opportunities, I think. Um, the one effect that I showed here seems promising, and there might be others. And then finally, um, what I showed here was just putting in modifications in the equations. What we need is a systematic derivation of effective equations, um, just like the 100 effective actions, morally at least, um, that follow the general uh, scheme to derive these terms, and that's also still in progress. So at some point, you might have reliable corrections um, that we expect from these equations. We don't have that yet, but at least indications exist. I'm oh, sorry. Start up this one. Thank you. Uses a similar algebra, then um, that would be at least an indication that this is the structure that we get for space time. So the hope is to find a generalized version of space time such that this algebra is then plays the same role for yeah. that generalized version as the old yeah. algebra. One more question. At which point did you deduce that this relation, this modified algebra relations, do not disturb? Covariance. Is it because that the Poisson bracket between H and D is, is not, is unmodified? Um, no, well, the strict sense of general covariance would refer to just the classical algebra. So I think that's related to the previous question. If you, uh, um, if you take the usual form of general covariance, which involves um, a kind of space time structure, then you would not even want um, any kind of deformation. Um, but, well, maybe I should call it uh, generalized general covariance because it's, um, and what, you, what you're really interested in, in the context of covariance is uh, consistency, initially, at least. Um, and, and from that perspective, this kind of algebra is just as good as um, the classical. And then it's just, it's just a question of the particular realization of um, your underlying space-time concepts which is where we usually apply the concept of covariance, but um, at least for the, at the level of equations, formulating equations, um, the form of the algebra doesn't matter, as long as there is still a closed algebra like this. And um, there are, and Dirac very early on has argued that this algebra is actually, should be considered as the more fundamental sense of formulating general covariance in the classical algebra. So from that perspective, um, we are still realizing the same Principle, the same covariance principle, is just a different um, realization of the algebra is different. But um, from the perspective of the dynamics and consistency, gauge structures, it doesn't matter whether you have corrections. Any more questions? No, if not, let's take the speaker. Okay. 